Good morning and welcome to the first in our new series of events, um, Current Briefings. Uh, today I'm joined by Ian Nichols from Alexon. He is metering manager there and we're going to have a bit of a chat about uh, the P um, the P375 um, code modification. So good morning, Ian. Ah, good morning. Uh, hopefully you can uh, hear me now. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so to start with, we've just got a quick presentation. And if at any point you have any questions, just stick them in the question box. And after the presentation, Ian will very kindly answer a few of them for us. So yeah, Ian, if you'd like to like to make a start. Yeah, no problem. Just uh, check before I start that uh, everyone can see the slides. Yeah, all good, I think. Right, thank you. So. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, a BSC modification P375, which was on the, the settlement of secondary BM units using metering behind the, the site boundary point. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the, sort of the background to this modification, how it came about and, and the particular issue that we're trying to solve and uh, where the the work group that was involved in it, the considerations for that solution and benefits to participants. And I think focus uh, a little bit in a subject area close to my heart is uh, the metering arrangements for uh, for this modification and a little bit about how the, uh, the interactions between uh, agents, agents will work. So if we just uh, go back to, uh, I think for those of you that aren't, familiar with the the balancing mechanism uh it's it's a mechanism that national grid electricity system operator uses to balance the network so they do that through balancing mechanism units uh as a, as a first pass where they can instruct uh based on uh bids and offers that participants have chosen to make to either sort of increase generation or reduce generation to help balance the network. Uh, and at the moment, prior to well, prior to the P344 modification, the, you could only do that if you are a central volume allocation registered site, which meant you were a, a, a balancing mechanism unit uh, in your own right. Uh, we now call those primary BM units uh, following P344. Uh, so P344 was uh, started life as a called Project Ter, and this was a, a European balancing project for the Trans-European Replacement Reserves Exchange, but it was also to give wider access to the, the balancing mechanism. And we're currently going to do that through the settlement of what we now call secondary BM units, and that's using the supplier volume allocation registered boundary point metering systems. So that's effectively a, an MPAN sort of level, uh, which you, you couldn't participate in the BM uh, prior to that. Uh, uh, well, not uh, typically. We could, there was an option for suppliers to do it through additional BM units, but that uh, hadn't been commonly used up to this point. So P344 allowed a, a virtual lead party to use, aggregate a number of MPANs to be able to uh, allocate them to a secondary BM unit to participate in the, the BM. Now, the work group that was involved in the solution for that uh, raised raised an issue with uh, balance and service being delivered, but that not being vi visible at the boundary point. Uh, and that led to issue group 70 which recommended that there was something that could be done about this and recommended raising modification P375, which is the use of metering behind the boundary point to, to settle on secondary BM units. Just to sort of illustrate the, oh, got the wrong way, all right. Just to illustrate the, uh, the problem that we're, we're trying to solve is that if we, Look at the simplified single line diagram on the right hand side of the screen that uh, the site has a, a boundary point metering system which will be uh, sort of registered in the by the supplier uh, and it will has as a minimum have an import mpan but if the site's capable of export could also have a, an export mpan associated with that that metering system so there's a, an asset that's delivering a balancing service behind that boundary point 
But if we were to deliver a benefit of two megawatts to the system, if the site is multi-use and there's there's a lot going on behind that site boundary point, if there's a an independent process that that starts up and increases demand by 1.5 megawatts, the boundary point meter will only show that 0.5 megawatts has been delivered. So the issue group was highlighted that well you've delivered a balance of service of two megawatts but the design of the p344 solution is that that can't be demonstrated by the boundary point metering system so that led to the proposal to use metering actually installed at the asset and uh, rather than having a, an m pan for it you would have what we call an asset metering system identifier and then you would just pair that up with the boundary point m pan to identify the connection between the asset and the, the site boundary point. Now the P375 working group was made up of uh, existing BSE parties. We had suppliers, half early data collectors, half early meter operators, uh, we had virtual lead parties and data aggregators and we had uh, EV charging companies. Uh, it was a a wide balance group uh, able to look at this sort of specific area behind the boundary point metering systems through involvement in other schemes such as the electricity market reform, capacity market and other balancing services activities with a with the system operator. Uh, so the key considerations that, that were looked at was we wanted to make it comparable to existing equivalent requirements in other schemes. Uh, and in that sense, for things like uh, axi level requirements of the metering system, uh, we, we needed to also balance the sort of the risk appetite and the cost that we didn't want to put some a system in place that was so risk averse that it was cost prohibitive to smaller players to to be able to participate in it. And, and the key driver was, uh, as sort of illustrated on the example in the previous slide, is that you you actually get rewarded for what you what you delivered that that benefit to the to the system. Uh, uh, not a reduced level because of uh, an independent process that uh, you had no involvement in. Uh, the potential benefits uh, for P375 was it was given smaller aggregators and smaller players uh, access to the balancing mechanism uh, and it was taken at one step beyond uh, where P344 had gone by able to bring in sort of multi-use, sort of more complex sites that would probably have been excluded or only been able to have been used in, in a limited basis uh, if it was possible to uh, to use them. Uh, I think there's a, a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in benefits to uh, sort of the uh, increase in sort of renewable energy and, and storage as we've sort of worked towards trying to get to, to net zero. And uh, as I mentioned, we had EV charging companies involved in the uh, charging, charging infrastructure uh, so they were uh, sort of heavily involved in it as well as uh, the way that a uh, secondary BM unit works is that you can aggregate a large number of small components up to uh, a BM unit level to make something that's a uh, significant value in terms of megawatts a secondary BM unit level uh, to be able to enter the balancing mechanism and we're getting put more integrated energy systems and uh, everything thinks about uh, sort of smart grids and uh, the, the future sort of distribution system operators trying to balance their own their own areas and it gives clear provision of data uh, so sort of more clear and uh, transparent uh, look at what uh, what's actually going on So, if I start off talking about the P375 solution, uh, I'll talk a bit about the, the metering solution. Currently under the, the BSC, we have metering codes of practice for, for half early settlement. Uh, and this is where I mentioned about sort of balancing risk, appetite and, and cost. So the, the BSC metering codes of practice are, are, are split in, in terms of, sort of risk profile. So our code of practice one is for sites with a rated capacity of uh, over 100 MVA. So they need to be more accurate metering equipment. Well, once we get down to the, the sites that uh, are up to one megawatt demand, we don't need that equipment to be to be as accurate. 
And one thing that was looked at was, well, we could just say you need to install a, an approved half hourly meter, but this would have uh, made it not viable to the, the smaller players. Uh, the half hourly meter solution is really based around more sort of larger industrial and commercial sites, uh, where it's a smaller number of sites being used, but a larger energy value that we're talking about, that it's more cost effective to, to use a, a half hourly meter. So that opened it up into uh, using operational meters and uh, it's a non BSE approved half hourly meters. That's an energy meter that still records on a half hourly basis, but it's not compliant with one of the, the existing codes of practice. So the, the first two asset metering types that, that we used uh, were all based on uh, being compliant with the current IEC measurement instruments directive and approved by, by the BSE standards but we, we broadened it out into a, a third category uh, and this was aimed at the particularly the, the smaller more, uh, market where it was uh, a metering device that was embedded within the product so an EV charging unit or a small scale battery storage unit that has the, the metrology embedded within that that product uh, which was a a bit of a departure from what we would, would normally deal with but uh, while standards for this type of uh, meter arrangements are being developed, uh, we expanded COP11 to uh, to include these. Uh, and I mentioned COP11, and I, I mentioned other metering codes of practice, but uh, COP11 is a, effectively a, a single code of practice where the different levels of energy being recorded are split up into asset metering types within that uh, that document. So I did mention. Code of practice one was for rated capacities greater than 100 MVA. The equivalent in COP11 is asset metering type one. Uh, we, we work our way down uh, equivalent wise until we get to this, uh, the new one, which is asset metering type five, which is specific to these metering devices embedded within the product. Uh, the COP specifies the minimum requirements. So it talks about accuracy of metering equipment. It talks about uh, sort of uh, data security. Uh, it talks about uh, register readings and uh, the functionality that it is required uh, and the key driver is that it must be recorded energy in 30 minute settlement period format although that doesn't necessarily have to be by the asset meter itself the asset meter could provide an output to a system that gathers that data and then converts into 30 minute settlement period format the other aspect to the metering solution is the, the approval process for the meter and any data collection from it. So currently we have a, a balancing and sediment code procedure uh, 601, which is the metering protocol approval and compliance testing. And that is a series of tests that the meters have to go through to prove that they're compliant with the relevant COP. And what we've taken is We've expanded that for COP11 for the, the operational meters. So if you're already a BSE approved half hourly meter against uh, one of the codes of practice, you're automatically allowed to use that for the, the equivalent asset metering type uh, through COP11. The, the extension to BSE 601 is for the second category operational meters and the, the non BSE approved half hourly meters, and then the metering devices embedded within a product. Uh, the other thing to consider is that uh, for any device to be able to be used in the BSC, there needs to be an approved data collector that can uh, communicate with that meter effectively and bring back the data and submit it to, to settlement. And that's the protocol aspect of, of that test. Now, in terms of the solution and the interactions between uh, virtual lead parties and their agents, uh, we designed a system for the code subsidiary documents based on the existing supplier hub principles, which the uh, the MPAN world uh, relies on as its uh, methods to uh, operate effectively. Uh, and that's split into five key areas. So we've got uh, the qualification of the agents that they're qualified to perform that particular role that they want to be uh, taken up in the, under the BSC. Uh, registration, so in this case, we're talking about registering the uh, the asset and the asset metering system, 
metering operations with, describes the, the interaction with the virtual lead party and the meter operator. It talks about requirements for installation of the asset metering system, commissioning all of it, maintaining it, and uh, responding to any, any faults that are highlighted. Uh, and data collection is the, the gathering of the data from the, the asset metering system and then being able to pass that on through the, the settlement process as well as being able to do some, some validations on, on the quality of that data. And lastly, the, the, the assurance aspect, uh, one of the key drivers of the BSC is the performance assurance. Uh, we have a performance assurance board who have a number of techniques that they can use to focus on key risk areas. So that's uh, sort of an order of back office systems and processes to make people uh, make sure people are following the, the balance and settlement code procedures and uh, some site audits to check the, uh, the quality and the, the operation of the, the asset metering uh, themselves. There's a number of roles that can be involved in, in this VLP hub principle. So there are virtual lead parties at the moment. Uh, they're limited to using MPANs only and uh, their qualification is, is purely linked to that. For asset metering to work, the, the VLP then needs to appoint agents uh, and be able to send uh, appropriate flows with instructions and uh, dealing with uh, data for the, the whole process to work, which would normally be done by the supplier under the, the, the usual settlement processes. But for asset metering and purely for the balancing mechanism, it's the asset metering VLP that would do that. And that's going to be an additional role that uh, needs to be a qualification for. Uh, in terms of the, the meter operator side of things, uh, the expectation is that uh, an approved, qualified SVA half hourly meter operator agent uh, can do asset metering operations uh, without going through any additional qualifications. We have created a, an additional role, which is an asset metering meter operator agent. Uh, but this is limited to the metering devices embedded within products and uh, asset metering type four, but for the, the whole current market on, only, uh, as it was deemed to be uh, low risk without the, the use of measurement transformers. And th this was brought about for if people have sort of unique bits of uh, pieces of equipment that they want to use that the a current meter operator may not be comfortable working with uh, equipment that they, they wouldn't normally use based because they normally would use just uh, sort of half early metering equipment. Uh, half early data collectors that can gather that data. Again, uh, they're the existing BSE qualified agents. And we've created an additional role, again, for the sort of more bespoke types of equipment that could come out where a half early data collector may not want to go through the protocol approval process. Uh, we didn't want to exclude these this type of equipment, so we've developed a, an asset metering half early data collector role as well. Uh, and the way the code subsidiary documents have been designed is that if all parties are have a data transfer network gateway, they can use the existing data flows, the D flows, where those are available to communicate. But the option will be able to use other means, which we call sort of P flows uh, to, to interacting parties. And there will be a number of new P flows where the, the existing supplier hub flows uh, aren't, aren't applicable. The idea is that an asset metering system ID will be to a similar format to the, the core MPAN, so 13 digit with a, a two digit start that's not currently in use that will purely be dedicated to asset metering systems. Uh, just looking at the the end-to-end -end process, so you'll have your uh, virtually party responsible uh, as a registrant for the overall process. The meter operator will install the asset meter. That will either be downloaded directly by the half-hourly data collector, or in the cases where there's an asset meter and half-hourly data collector appointed, uh, they will download and validate data and pass that validated data to the, the half-hourly data collector. The half-hourly data collector different to how the, the BSE works in the moment, because it would normally be the half early data aggregator that would have the interaction with the supplier volume allocation agent. So in this case, HHDC would send AMSID level data to, to SFA. Uh, the SFA is our, our central systems, and uh, the whole the registration process that's been developed will use uh, the new Alexon Connect platform for virtual lead parties to apply to register for asset metering system IDs and register their uh, asset metering systems and uh, 
that will include the sort of the, the identity of the, the appointment of the, the relevant agents that, that we uh, are using. Uh, in terms of the calculations uh, side of uh, of SFA, it, it's building on the modification P344 for the for the wider access, and it's just expanding it for the these asset metering systems uh, rather than uh, it being based on on MPANs. Uh, just to finish off, just a, a summary of what's been happening in the, the last few months. So the uh, modification report for P3 Sim 5 was presented to the BSC panel in December last year and sent to Ofgem with the recommendation for approval. And that included COP11 and the amendments to BSC 601, which are fixed, subject to any change required to them, uh, been done through our existing uh, change proposal uh, process under the BSC. Uh, Ofgem approved uh, P375 in February of this year uh, with an expected implementation date of the end of June 2022. Uh, what we've been working on in the last uh, few months is developing these code subsidiary documents uh, in conjunction with a, an industry expert group made up of virtually parties, data collectors and, and meter operators uh, to develop the processes for industry as to how this will all come together and uh, you know how you will register on the meter operations and the data collection and uh, how data is submitted to ourselves so uh there are not quite, i did when we made these slides up we thought they would be out for industry review at the moment but uh that's that's now looking like it'll either be later this week or, or next week so i would uh, advise that uh, if you are particularly interested in this modification and participating keep an eye on the p375 page of the, the alexon website for for any updates uh, so thank you and uh for your time and if you know any any questions you can uh, drop yourself an email or you can use the, the bse change mailbox uh, uh to highlight any questions that you're looking for an answer Thanks, Ian. That was great. Um, we've got loads of questions in, in the chat as well. So um, I suppose just to start with, how would you how would this work with a SMETS meter? Oh, a SMEX meter. Uh, yeah, we're still uh, looking at the sort of domestic arrangements. We're sort of in conversation with, with Ofgen and, and Bayes about how how things are going to going to interact. But the the SMEX sort of, boundary point meter itself. Uh, at the moment, the only way that, that this solution works is everything needs to be in the, the half hourly world. So with the market wide half hourly settlement is, is rolled out, that, that'll be the more widespread. But there are some sort of options under the BSC where you can uh, use a, what they call a supplier service meter, where the, the supplier gets the, the boundary point data from the, the data communications company who sort of manages the, the SMETs side of uh side of things uh and could participate in that that way uh in terms of the there was another sort of bse modification p379 which was taken forward that that had more interaction would have had more interaction with the, the boundary point meter because it was the idea of that was using uh, multiple suppliers for for billing purposes and in that one we would have had a lot more in indication interaction with with the smet side of things but this, this is a sort of separate balancing activity rather than a, a billing activity so if somebody did want to put something behind a domestic boundary point the customer would still see the billing would be accurately based on the boundary meter and it would all be uh you know, visible on the in home display unit, they wouldn't see anything from anything COP11 related. Someone else has actually asked about the P379 um, and saying P379 has been shelved in part because Alexon felt that P375 enabled aspects of multiple supplier models. Could you talk about the P375, about how P375 could enable multiple suppliers? Uh, it doesn't, uh, to be honest. Uh, it, it just gives you the option of uh, where anybody's got any kind of, uh, sort of you know, social housing where they've got sort of managing solar panels and roofs, it just gives them access to another scheme in the balancing mechanism. But it's not actually, you will still only have a single supplier for the boundary point metering system. The, the P375 is purely for the balancing mechanism and it allows the separate entity, which is 
like the supplier themselves, all of the virtual lead party to participate certain boundary point M pans or asset metering system IDs in a secondary BM unit. It's not there's no multiple suppliers involved mm -hmm. in terms of, sort of settlement and billing aspects of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, the next question is what about additional BMUs for those that have opted for the supplier route rather than the VLP route? Uh, the same issue can apply to additional BMUs, no? Yeah, that uh, hasn't been picked up for, for asset metering. Uh, if, uh, it's something that has been sort of highlighted to us that uh, once PG75 was approved that uh, you know we had this route where you could do an additional BM unit at the, the boundary point but but not uh, not for the asset meter and uh, at the moment that modification doesn't doesn't cover that uh, uh, it's something that's it's messed that would have to be picked up by uh, by another sort of uh, BSE change process unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, eventually EVs will replace cars, looking at one third on charge over a winter evening, circa 2040, shows a possible DR modulate, modu apologies, modular table resource circa 80 gigawatts, assuming domestic charging, even 10% of this is useful. Will P375 allow mod modulation or recording of services from domestic EVs on the 230 volt system using DR? Uh, I mean, we've tried not to exclude anything. Uh, we've, we've tried to keep it that it's it's, it's uh, any any type of technology could be the asset. Uh, I would just sort of purely put a framework in place for what the metering needs to do, the metrology side of thing, and then you know how you get that that data into, into settlement. So, yeah, I mean, I, ideally, that's you know that, that's the sort of market that we're sort of looking to participate in P375. Mm -hmm. uh, for sites which do split metering from the boundary, would this modification allow for independent generators to retrofit in import-export asset metering behind the boundary so that each site can have an independent metering? Uh, yes, uh, yes you can do that. Uh, on the P375. It's, it's, it's something you could do through a uh, metering dispensation at the moment where you can effectively split uh, the site up into separate elements. Uh, uh, that, but that's that's sort of done with this uh, assessment and sort of billing aspects in mind as well. So you get an actual separate MPAN and there's a sort of complex arrangement where you, you do somebody installs sub metering and then they net it off the, off the boundary point. So for asset metering you, you don't need that, that that metering dispensation assuming everything else is compliant but what that that will give you is the ability to separate the site up for the the secondary bm unit but you would still be settled on the, the boundary point levels unless you the, the metering dispensation route and then you, you're more following the, the p344 route of, of using mpans and if pn's required for a boundary point does this if PNs are required for a boundary point, does this present a situation where the supplier and the VLP would both be submitting PNs for the same boundary point? Uh, yes, but we, part of the P375 solution would uh, take account of anything that the asset had delivered behind the boundary point to take account of the supplier's imbalanced position, so that should that should should accommodate that, okay. if I've understood the question correctly. I think uh, we have one more minute left, so one more quick question, if that's okay with you. Yeah, um, okay. RPNs always required for VLPs for their secondary BMUs before the P375 implemented, or do PNs always need to be for the boundary point? Can they be issued for an asset instead? Uh, yeah, I believe that uh, there being a secondary BM unit, it's still uh, there's still a requirement to submit uh, a PN. So there's some obligations under the under the CUSC to uh, sort of notify the National Grid of what you're doing. But you, you can you just uh, sort of the responsible VLP to data aggregator will aggregate all the the assets or MPANs are using into uh, into the secondary BM unit and uh, you know provide that sort of level of uh, information to the sort of system operators control room and they also you know provide the the pns based on the 
the aggregated total. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us, Ian. Uh, the presentation was really interesting. Thank you for asking so many, answering so many questions. Um, if you do have more questions, I know there's quite a few that we didn't manage to get around to. Um, I'm sure Ian wouldn't mind answering a few after. So if you either reach out to him or if you reach out to us at Solar Media, um, we'll be able to pass them on. And apart from that, thank you everyone for joining us. Keep an eye out on the current website for the next current briefing session. And apart from that, I hope everyone has a really lovely Wednesday. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.